Thank you very much, Christopher, and through you, thanks to Natasha for the invitation. This is such a lovely venue, and it's really a pleasure and a privilege to be here. Um, my theme is, is clear, Rising China and Global Justice. Uh, there's been a lot happening in international politics in the last 30 or 40 years, and I don't want to deny many of the other important events, the invasion of Af Afghanistan, Iraq, uh, the first um, I I Iraq uh, intervention in 1991, all those sorts of things have been going on. I want to focus on two issues only, but I think they, they're both important and I think they haven't really been studied very much um, together in terms of the interactions between them. One is rising China and the other is global justice. Rising China, since 1978, say, open door policy and the economic surge since then and the increasing awareness that we all have of China as a great power. And on the other hand, global justice since, say, 1989, and I'll, I'll talk about both of these contextually uh, in, in just a minute, but let's say since 1989 for now, with the end of the Cold War, the collapse of the Soviet system, and the growing belief that uh, issues of justice could not be left entirely to sovereign states to oversee, but sometimes issues of justice transcend borders and sovereignty must give way to issues of justice themselves. And we've also seen, um, as a kind of practical reinforcement of that growing belief, action across borders. We've seen novel actors getting involved in, in issues of justice, actors that would not previously, in previous decades, have been involved in that sort of business. And we've seen a challenge to the core principle that has ordered international society for centuries, the principle of state sovereignty. Yes, it's been um, organized hypocrisy, to use Krasner's phrase, it's never been perfect. But that said, there have been new, both rhetorical and practical challenges to, to, the, to this, this core principle of international society. So those are the two themes and my question's at the bottom of the slide and it's very simple. What impact is the rise of China likely to have on the pursuit of global justice? So that's how I want to focus for the next 40 or 45 minutes. Just a brief bit of context, I'm not going to say very much about this to a, a crowd at the Confucius Institute because I take you know, the China background largely for granted. Um, the the 5,000 years, the, the more than 2,000 years of, 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 st of state history, the expansion of China, the tribute system, um, the fact that Beijing was the biggest city in the world until 1850 when it was overtaken by London, that China had the biggest economy in the world until about 1890 when the, the US economy took over. The fact that we've been fascinated by China before, uh, Xin Wazari, and you know, that was an enlightenment fascination, Voltaire and the philosoph were very interested in China because it proved that you could be a successful um, state system without having the Catholic Church behind you, and so that was all part of their critique of Catholicism in France. Uh, but not, you didn't just have to be in that camp. If you go to any of the major national trust properties in England, they all have a Chinese cabinet from the 18th century or something like that. You know, Shinwazari, as Jonathan Spence says in The Search for Modern China, was an 18th century fascination across much of Western Europe. But then, the great divergence, Ken Pomerantz, um, his great book, he says, take Western Europe and China in roughly 1800. One was unified, China, the other was fragmented, Western Europe. But if you look at them in terms of economic bulk, in terms of trajectory over previous centuries, there wasn't much to choose between them. The Great Divergence, he says, dates from 1800, roughly. Uh, then you get sustained industrialization in Western Europe and none of that in China, meaning that by the time you get to 1900 or the year 2000, Western Europe and its satellites, say in North America and, and, and a few other parts of the world, are far ahead. They've diverged considerably from, from China, which has been left behind. As a result of that, you get the century of humiliation with you know, nearly 20 uh, powers from other parts of the world taking concessions in China, uh, leading to this system of, uh, of China being, as Mao put it, um, quasi-colonial and quasi-feudal, uh, a century of humiliation from roughly the, 18, the middle of, of the 19th century to the middle of the 20th century. And then in 1949, finally, you know, the end of this long wait for, again, as Mao put it, China to stand up. Um, he said on, on the 1st of October 49, 475 million Chinese people have stood up. They're 1.3 billion now. But um, that, what the point I want to make is that rising China is not 
um, completely unprecedented, but it is different. China has never been a global power before. China has not been a member of international society, which is truly planetary uh, in the way that it is today. China, of course, was the dominant power within its domain. And the, the Chinese emperor was recognized as, as, as the leading political figure throughout East Asia. But China had no engagement with Africa, no engagement with South America, no engagement with Western Europe. Um, and so what we're witnessing today is new, even though it's not entirely unprecedented, because China's been, been big and important before. And I'm not going to go through the data either, but you know, the two key lines on this slide are the one that shows second, the second one down that, that China's got the world's biggest population. Well, that's been the case you know, for, for many, many centuries. Um, and p of more interest is the bottom figure, which shows that in 2010, Chinese GDP, real GDP growth was 10.3%. Uh, well, that's interesting, but it's even more interesting when you know, we know that that number, or something like that number, has been uh, reproduced for more than 30 years, ever since Open Door in, in the late 1970s. So China has grown in real terms by roughly 8 to 9 percent per year, uh, ever since the late 1970s, and more than 30 years of economic growth. And that is what's driving, obviously, a lot of this core fascination with, with what that means for global politics. I just want to dwell a little bit on this slide, because, say, just 10 years ago, if you took Gordon Chang, uh, the coming collapse of China, or a little less than 10 years ago, seven years ago, if you took Bruce Gilley, Chinese democratic future, the sense was then, around the turn of the millennium, and certainly before the turn of the millennium, that um, really there wasn't, wasn't much to be concerned about in terms of how international politics was going to, international society was going to be ordered. We were talking then about the hyperpower. You know, if you looked at foreign affairs from those days, the dominant theme was really how the US overwhelmed everybody else. You know, it spent as much on defense as the next X number of, 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 of major defense spenders. Um, it was the most present in, in every forum, you know, however you wanted to measure it, the USA was the story. And that was reflected really in the China literature. None of these is an academic. Of course, standing behind them is a lot of solid academic analysis. All of them instead, with the, with the partial exception of Gilly, all of them are journalists, think tankers, um, people who are trying to capture the zeitgeist in some sense, who are maybe exaggerating the story a little bit, to you know, attract public attention and, and, and to capture where China is going. They're trying to interpret not only um, in a kind of nuanced and balanced and on the one hand this, on the other hand the other uh, academic way. You know, they're, they're, they're slightly twisting the story and, and, and pointing up their story. But nevertheless, I think they give us a good sense of how China has been seen and perceived by uh, the Western world over the last decade or so. So Chang, the coming collapse of China, you know, the core thesis is that this isn't going to last for very much longer. You can't liberalize an economy, but stagnate a political system under authoritarianism for very much longer. In the end, the tensions are going to be too great. Uh, this market liberalism has to chew away at political authoritarianism, and there will be a collapse. He said in 2001, maybe if they can keep the show on the road for about another 30 years, they may get away with it. They may pull it off. Um, but he didn't expect it. He thought within four or five years China would collapse. Well, it's gone for ten of those thirty years so far and we haven't seen the collapse yet. Uh, Bruce Gilley was a, a reading of modernization theory into, into the Chinese context. He argued that we know from modernization theory all around the world that again, if you grow an economy and you create a middle class, uh, a bourgeoisie, you know, a, a series of, of, of actors with an interest in political reform, it will happen. We'd seen it in Chinese societies, for instance, in Taiwan. We'd seen it in other Confucian societies, South Korea, both of them in the late 1980s, and we'd seen it in many parts of the world. So he said, ultimately, China will democratize, democratize too. In fact, he, 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 he pinned his colors to, to 2019 as the longest that China could possibly sustain non-democracy. So he said, you know, if, if, if you push me, if you, if you want to know how long I think this can possibly be sustained, then for the record, 2019 is the, is the outpost of China's non-democratic presence. It must go democratic by 2019. It was very, very um, reductionist argument. He said, well, there's only been two authoritarian systems that have really lasted a long time 
in, in modern history. One is the Communist Party of the Soviet Union, which lasted roughly 70 years, and, and the other was the Mexican PRI, also lasted about 70 years. So let's take 70 years from 1949, and we get to 2019, and you know that's, as I said, tops for, for Chinese authoritarian system. Well, he may still be proved right, there's another eight years to go. But um, the theme back then really was that China's either going to implode or it's going to become one of us. It's just going to become another well-behaved democratic state. And so you know, the, the notion of there being a China challenge was not very present ten years ago, seven or eight years ago. But that's no longer the theme. If you take from, from Charm, Charm offensive, offensive all the way through to the Beijing Consensus, the theme of all of those books is, the, the final six on that slide, is that China matters and China poses a, a threat, um, sometimes seen more, more positively, sometimes seen more negatively. For instance, Martin Jakes, When China Rules the World. That's not necessarily a bad thing. There's, there's certainly some issues of concern. He's worried about Chinese racism, for instance. Um, but he also sees some good in, in, in China ruling the world to some extent, or, or almost wholly, in fact. Whereas other people are much more negative, as you can see from, from the titles of their books. Um, maybe the, the most negative, actually, are Charm Offensive and the Beijing Consensus, both of which um, say, you know, there's a real threat here to a, a Western hegemonic international system. And I guess, you know, I'm within that camp in that I'm talking about rising China and global justice because I feel China will make a difference and we need to consider what that difference is likely to be. Just briefly on, on global justice, that too wasn't invented in 1989. Um, you know, if you, if, if you look back into, of course, it, it, it draws a lot on enlightenment principles, the rights of man and, and all of that, read on a global scale. Um, and it was precisely in the 18th century that many of these issues started to become practical politics, particularly with the, the, the slave trade, uh, the date, 1787, is, is the formation of the first recognisable INGO, to use contemporary language. 1807 is, is the British Parliament passing legislation to abolish the slave trade, and in 1833 to outlaw slavery itself, not just trading slaves, but, but the institution of slavery. And then flowing on from that, the creation of the ICRC, the Red Cross, in, in, in 1863, the Crimean War. Um, concerted European action uh, on, on humanitarian grounds in Greece, Syria and, and Bulgaria. The Gladstone's Midlothian campaign in the late 1870s was dominated by the Bulgarian issue. Um, and then in the 20th century, the formation of the United Nations, yes, a very statist institution, but with some humanitarian concern in there, the Chapter 7 issue in, in, in the UN Charter, which allows for some challenges to state sovereignty when there are threats to international peace and security, but only Chapter 7 allows that. Otherwise, the entire UN Charter is, is a very statist document. The Declaration of Human Rights, universal, and the Helsinki Accords in the mid-1970s. And then, you know, the great INGOs of the contemporary age, Amnesty, uh, Médecins Sans Frontières, and Human Rights Watch. All of these uh, are interested in issues of global justice and are interested in issues of of trans-border, cross-border action in pursuit of global justice. But a lot of that action that I've got on this slide, the pre-1989 stuff, was largely restricted to greater Europe. And it, was a long, it took a long time for the humanitarian international to really generate a significant counter to Ves Westphalian state sovereignty, and as I said, that core organizing principle of, of international society. The data here is not quite so good. It's easy to measure the size of China, even though the data is not perfect. But it's not so easy to kind of capture something like global justice, which, ca which, which covers a whole range of activity. So I just tried to put a few signals here. Um, in international society, the shocks, the, the, the kind of negatives, which have driven much concern, I think, more than anything, were threefold. Rwanda and the genocide and 800,000 people being... Uh, murdered in, in, in just about a month. Uh, Kosovo in 1999 was a shock, particularly for China. I'll come back to that a bit later. Um, NATO action, but no Security Council or UN endorsement. And the long-running Darfur crisis in Sudan um, in, in, in this century. And they triggered, particularly the first two, Rwanda and Kosovo, directly fed into RTP, the Responsibility to Protect, which was a document produced in 2001 by a Canadian-sponsored think tank um, 
which argued that in some circumstances, chiefly two, two, two main circumstances, one mass murder, i.e. genocide, and the other one, mass migration, i.e. ethnic cleansing. So genocide and ethnic cleansing were the big two concerns. In, in those sorts of circumstances, um, the sovereign state, uh, or state sovereignty, can see place, can temporarily be suspended, and the responsibility to protect uh, populations under those sorts of threats of genocide and ethnic cleansing can devolve to the international community. The responsibility to protect those people can shift from the state to international society as a whole. Uh, there's no argument in there for um, regime change. There's no argument for, say, overthrowing Saddam Hussein or, or killing Colonel Gaddafi or any of those sorts of things. It's a very limited responsibility, really to restore a status quo ante where uh, uh, severe human rights violations are no longer possible. That was endorsed by the World Summit, and the World Summit was a meeting of the United Nations. So it was endorsed by states including China, including all of the, 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 the members of the Security Council in 2005. And Libya was important earlier this year because it was the first time that the Security Council endorsed military enforcement of R2P principles. Again, I mean, this is one of China's problems looking back on the, on the Libya resolution, which it agreed to, or which it didn't, at least didn't veto, um, that in the end, the mandate was interpreted by the British and the French and the Americans as regime change. But China never intended it to be regime change. It was protection of a vulnerable population inside Libya. It was a responsibility to protect mandate, not a regime change mandate. And there's been a lot of growth in aid activity as well. And, 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 and perhaps most important, there's been the rise of what's called new, huma the new humanitarianism and novel actors. I mean, just take uh, multinational corporations. Sometimes they get involved in humanitarian issues, which was never part of their, their business um, in, in, in previous decades. And if you look at the record of many multinational corporations in, in parts of the developing world, you know, it's absolutely horrific. But that is no longer possible. There's shareholder activism, there's campaigning group activism, um, all of which has led to a new notions of corporate social responsibility, um, socially responsible investment, and a humanitarian engagement by multinational corporations. That's new. I don't have such a clear story to tell in terms of analysis. Again, none of these is, is, is academic. Uh, Samantha Power won a, a Pulitzer for a problem from hell, and she's part of Hillary, Hillary Clinton's team in the State Department. Um, her problem from hell was genocide, and how do we deal with that? Uh, Alex Duval in famine crimes, you know, that's African poverty. And how do we respond effectively to that? David Reef in A Bed for the Night argued against humanitarianism, against the new hum humanitarian turn, and, uh, and said that we should just go back to simple charity, because we didn't know how to do humanitarianism. We did know how to do charity. And so on, Dambisa Moyo, dead aid, turn off the aid tap, she argues for Africa and let Africans kind of find their own two feet and, and, and make their own way in the world. The general theme of all of these, and they stretch over more than a decade now, is that we don't really know what we're doing in this new humanitarian domain. We, we aren't sure of our moral principles, of our moral foundations. Uh, we've lost our moral compass to some extent, and uh, a lot of issues are, are up for grabs. You can see again in, in, in the, some of the titles, the crisis caravan um, is, is a clear instance. So there's a lot of um, intellectual and, and policy ferments as well. There's, much more, there's certainly much more activity, much more cross-border engagement, but there are also many more problems. And as I've said, the moral foundations are increasingly insecure. That's not to say they were, they were perfectly secure before 1989, but more and more people are being challenged. The whole aid, aid industry or aid business is now open to critique in a way that wasn't the case in the 1960s, 70s and 80s. And there's also a lot of academic debate about what global justice should comprise, and I'll be coming back to that later. And in practical discourse also, interventions are always contentious. Every single intervention or failure to intervene is contentious. And there's talk about how the UN is failing to step up to the plate. It's no longer providing the leadership that is necessary in this age of humanitarian concern 
and uh, global action. But one of the thing that, things that's interesting about this whole debate is that, by and large, it takes place without China. There's one very important qualification or caveat to that, which is that anything coming up to the Security Council, of course, involves China, because China is a, a P5 veto-wielding member of the Security Council. It can't be bypassed. Um, it can veto any issue that it chooses to veto. But beyond that, there's not much China talk in debates about global justice. And I think there are a number of reasons for that. One is China's unusual history as a member, a fully paid up member of international society. You know, the fact that in 49, the United States chose to continue to recognize the nationalist government, Chiang Kai-shek's nationalist government, which would now only control Taiwan, and not to rec recognize Red China, which controlled the whole of mainland China. And that wasn't reversed until 71. And in fact, it wasn't until 79 that the US uh, formally recreated a, a, a bilateral relationship with China. So the 1970s was still a gray zone for Chinese re-entry into international society, or entry to some extent, because there wasn't anything that we'd recognize as international society back in, in, in the years when, when China was a major power in East Asia. Um, also, China always had in the West a persistent image of international delinquency. For the first, say, 15 years after World War II, down to roughly 1960, China was allied with the Soviet Union and therefore on the wrong side of the Cold War, as far as uh, we on this side of the Cold War were concerned. And when it broke with the Soviet Union in the, in the early 1960s, it was then seen as still delinquent because there was the notion of Maoist permanent revolution, which led not only to the Cultural Revolution inside China, but also to, or was seen as being part of, a number of revolutionary movements in, in third world countries, in Africa and elsewhere. There was never much Chinese finance for those movements, but there was rhetorical support. Uh, China was always, always very, very consistently anti-apartheid anti in South Africa, before it was... Um, you know, the acceptable policy in international society to, to be that. And so China was seen as being beyond, beyond the realm of, of mainstream uh, global action. And even more recently, when China has definitely become a, a, a more established player in international society, there are concerns about China in Africa, China as a, a development player. And I'll be talking about that too in a, in a, in a moment. So, you know, still today, China is seen as, to some extent, an international delinquent. Um, and then, I guess, if we look at the whole debate, the whole discourse about global justice, I think, I think there are three key concepts here. One is sovereignty. The whole global part of global justice is about, you know, acting beyond, beyond your own frontier and, and interfering, if you like, in another state. So sovereignty is a key concept and a key issue. Rights as well, because the whole debate is driven by, by rights talk and by human rights concerns, and justice itself. Those three concepts are uniformly captured uh, in, Western, in Western terms. They, all of them date back to the Enlightenment, or, or roughly 18th century. You know, they, were, they, they, they took on an important flowering then. Now, of course, people were talking about justice way back in, in uh, ancient times, you know, Plato, Aristotle, and all the rest. But... You know, it's Western discourse that is dominant here, not Chinese discourse. And so Chinese contributions tend to get uh, marginalized. And I guess also on a very practical level, if the members of the humanitarian international in good standing, and there are many, many people doing humanitarian work, uh, also from China and India and, and other parts of the world. You know, there, there is humanitarian action going on. But the members of the humanitarian international, those who are taken seriously, who contribute to policy debate, who are consulted at the United Nations, all of that come above all from North America and Western Europe. They do not come from, from other parts of the world still. So again, non-Western non voices are, are, are pushed to one side. And one important result of this is that in China and in many other parts of the developing world, there's a, there's a broad suspicion of a powerful, wealthy North imposing its views of how to do development, how to do democracy, how to do governance on a poor and vulnerable South. So how might we debate global justice with China? Um, given that you know, this isn't happening very much at present, where could we look for pointers? 
Well, these are the three main chapters of, of what I want to talk about in, in the rest of the discussion. First of all, we can look to China's record as a global actor. China's been very present in development contexts for many decades. Uh, what's it been doing? And uh, what is it that kind of characterizes Chinese engagement with development issues? Secondly, China's evolving engagement with international society. As I said, China is a P5 member of the Security Council, so what's it been doing there? At the peak of, 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 of international society, what is China's record there? And then thirdly, Chinese debate, academic debate, notably coming out of the Confucian tradition, which, as is evident from the speeches of, of President Hu Jintao, but is also evident in a number of uh, academic forums in, in, in all of the major Chinese universities now, is experiencing a revival. What does Confucianism tell us about these themes of, core themes of global justice? Well, let's start then with China as a, as a global actor. This again picks up on the issue of international delinquency. As I said, even though China is no longer on the wrong side of the Cold War and there isn't even a Cold War, China is no longer preaching Maoist revolution in Africa, still seen as an international delinquent. Why is that? Well, chiefly because it's seen as a rogue donor. It's seen as, as engaging with development issues uh, chiefly to fulfill its own resource needs for oil, gas, various minerals, all of them necessary to drive its, its stunning economic progress. And it's seen as having limited or, or maybe no concern for human rights. So a rogue donor in that sense, yes, it does give aid, but it gives aid to Mugabe just as much as it gives aid to, you know, more deserving causes. Uh, so Zimbabwe, Mugabe, no problem. Sudan, Darfur crisis, no problem. You know, China is prepared to engage in all of these settings. Um, and its aid generally comes without, with, with no strings attached. So the IMF or the World Bank show up and, and offer aid packages, but all of them have governance reforms that are required as a condition of downloading that aid. Um, China has none of those conditions, and you know, so it's often seen as triggering a race to the bottom. And in fact, building a glo global coalition of support by underhand methods. So you know, not having um, clean hands as a donor, but being a dirty hands donor, and undermining efforts sponsored by global institutions, World Bank, IMF, and the other international financial institutions to trigger um, agreed upon reforms in, 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 in all of these countries. So that's the enduring perception. You find it in a lot of op-ed columns, you find it in a lot of newspaper articles, and you find it in the blogosphere. It's very easy to, to pick up on, on, on that interpretation of China as a development actor, as a global actor. Academic analysis of, is, of course, more nuanced, and there's a lot of good work being done. Um, Ian Taylor's written, he's at St. Andrews, has written extensively on China and Africa. Deborah Brautigam, The Dragon's Gift, is a fantastic book, and she updates the analysis of the book in, a, in her own blog. So, you know, if you want to, you can follow up on the debate since she published the book in 2009. But she's been working on, on China and China and Africa since the early 1980s, and she pulls together an awful lot of stuff. And, and the, the line that comes out of the more academic analysis, not, not the, uh, the stuff that you find in op-ed columns, is that China has a largely consistent story in, say, Africa. And that, I guess, is the, the focus of, of, of much of this debate, because China is very present in Africa. Brassigam says that China is only, only not involved with one uh, sub-Saharan African country, and that's Swaziland. And the only reason is that Swaziland is still allied with Taiwan rather than with mainland China. But in every other, um, I think it's 45 sub-Saharan African countries, China is there as both a donor and, and a business um, player. So if, on the whole, the, the Chinese record is, is not large aid packages, not even large loan packages, but you know, relatively limited aid. That's not to say that they didn't fund the presidential palace for Mugabe. They did, but um, you know, relatively limited aid compared with, and, and of course, China is still a developing country it's, uh, itself. It's still a middle-income country itself. Um, but extensive business links tend to characterise Chinese engagement. As, as I said, this is this is the the, the the point that's focused on by many people who are criticising China 
most aggressively that it's all business. Well, it's not all business, but a large part of it is business, and that certainly comes through from these academic analyses. There's an infrastructure on, on, on kind of growth issues. Uh, there's, there's an emphasis on growth issues, infrastructure, uh, product production and training, uh, short courses in China, longer courses in China as well, training up uh, bureaucrats, technicians, engineers, whatever. Um, there's, of course, a, a large element of Chinese domestic development policy in Chinese external development policy. China itself is still developing, and it is the development story over the last 30 or 40 years. You know, more people have been moved out of absolute po poverty in China than, than anywhere else in the world, and, and most, of, most of the absolute poverty shift has taken place as a result of Chinese, Chinese growth. Um, and if you're uh, Somalia or Ethiopia or whatever, the Chinese story, of course, is, is very in, uh, compelling and, and intriguing. And so China, Chinese, uh, China's own domestic experience feeds a lot into Chinese development action. And that, of course, was not built on, on a prioritization of human rights, but rather on on, on a focus on growth and business and, and economic development. And, and China would claim that it's a very um, even-handed, frank, uh, respectful uh, global actor. It, it comes in uh, explicitly saying we're, we're here to do business, but we believe that by doing business with us, you too will benefit. Um, so China doesn't pretend that it's going into Africa mainly as a donor and then only surreptitiously is in fact doing business. You know, China's perfectly um, transparent about its business engage engagement with, with Africa and claims that it's a win-win uh, situation. China will benefit, but so too will its business, business partners. And of course, China's a very credible actor in, in much of Africa, simply because of the, the economic miracle and the extent of, uh, the su sustained extent of its growth story. But at the same time, there are concerns, and, and, and the countries I've named here are just illustrative. I mean, these concerns go far beyond the four countries that are on this slide. But, you know, corruption, uh, there was a very famous set-piece case when precisely um, <coughs> Angola was negotiating a World Bank or IMF loan and suddenly decided it wouldn't take it because China put the same amount of money on the table, but again, with no strings attached. Um, environmental de degradation, and critically for my interest, I mean, the critically re refers to this paper and this, this discussion, uh, there's, there's a lot of concern about human rights abuse in, in Sudan, in, in Zimbabwe, elsewhere. So I think even though you get a more nuanced analysis from the academics who are looking here, you don't get an entirely different picture of what China's doing in Africa. I wouldn't say that they totally dispel um, the picture that is painted by op-ed columnists and, and, and bloggers. You know, there is quite a lot of truth, and there, I think there is genuine concern if you come from a Western policy perspective about China's engagement with Africa. And I work on, on Burma, and so I have an interest in that. I don't want to go through this slide in any detail. All I want to say is that those concerns about China in Africa are echoed on, 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 in China's own neighborhood. China shares a long border with Burma, but it's consistently been supportive of military rule, which is very oppressive in the Burmese case, and has provided political cover in the Security Council and elsewhere. There's now a lot of contention about Chinese engagement, but that's also the case at a grassroots level in, in some of the African um, instances. Okay, secondly, China and international society, my second of the three chapters, as I said, that I want to look at in, in trying to figure out how China might impact on global justice debate. Um, China in international society has a very clear position, which is mainstream legal positivism, by which I mean the Chinese position reflects uh, written or, or um, agreed international law. The Chinese position on any particular um, question in the international domain is to look to international law and not look too much beyond it. And international law doesn't say too much about intervention. It doesn't say too much about global justice. It doesn't say too much about um, dispensing with state sovereignty, which is a necessary component of a global, globalist position. So China tends to be resistant on those grounds, that there's no provision for this in international law, and in particular, no provision for this in the UN Charter, which is at the absolute heart of international law. 
So as far as China is concerned, the core purpose of the United Nations is to pursue global justice, but by keeping the peace, which you know, it, China would argue is, is its critical contribution to global justice, um, through a regime of exclusive state sovereignty and non-intervention. And as I said, only Chapter 7 of the UN Charter allows for any suspension um, of state sovereignty. R2P, written in 2001, endorsed at the World Summit four years later in 2005, was not the same document that was endorsed. It had been considerably changed by the time it got UN endorsement in 2005, and in fact Security Council endorsement a year later in 2006. Um, it wasn't only China that was doing the watering down, but it did a large part of it. The US also played its part in that. The great powers really didn't want to give up too much of their freedom of manoeuvre uh, to the R2P, R2P movement. But yes, China was very concerned about R2P. It was seen as, as being a step too far. And Alex Bell Bellamy, if anybody wants to follow up, Alex Bellamy has written a lot on that. He was, he was an R2P core player and he's an academic in Australia. Um, of course, China insists on UN Security Council approval for any cross-border military engagement, so, and, and it possesses the veto in the Security Council, so its interests can always be protected. It hasn't used the veto that much. We saw it just recently on the double veto over Sudan, but on the whole, China's preferred not to be a, a major, major vetoer, other than, of course, on t Taiwan motions, which it routinely vetoes. Um, and the mantra is that human rights are an internal affair and the reading is that human rights are economic at least as much as political. The development that we're bringing to Africa and other parts of the world is, is a contribution to human rights just as much as all of your talk about governance reform. And if we look at some of the, the, the major debates in international society, not all of these have gone to the Security Council, so not all of them have a a record of Chinese voting or not voting uh, or abstaining. Um, but most of them have, in fact, from it, the first Iraq crisis in 1991 through to Darfur more recently. On the whole, China has been a recessive power um, and, where necessary, has you know, chosen um, to speak against motions, but usually it, its disapproval has been couched in an abstention rather than an actual veto. Uh, there are a couple of instances of support, so I wouldn't want to say that it's been a uniform uh, story or position that China has adopted through all these years. In Somalia in the early 1990s, China was supportive of international action uh, in Somalia because it, it couldn't find a functioning state to exercise sovereignty in Somalia, and so it was prepared to allow the international community to step in. Um, East Timor, it was, it was prepared to twist Indonesia's arm. Indonesia was the, the relevant power there before East Timor gained its independence. It was prepared to actually persuade the Indone Indonesians to say yes to international action and to generate the formal uh, state, local state consent that China prefers to find for any form of international engagement. So that was an unusual case. And also in Darfur. Darfur was, was characterised by the Genocide Olympics, the campaign led by a number of Hollywood celebrities, Richard Gere and Mia Farrow and Steven Spielberg and others, um, to paint China uh, as, as a little bit... Berlin 2008 is a little bit like Berlin 1936. Uh, so Beijing 2008, Berlin 1936. You know, there was something politically um, unspeakable about China not domestically so much, that, that may have been a subtext, as internationally. And China, the argument was, was prepared to endorse genocide if, if its business interests stood in a, you know, happened to overlap with, that, with those of a genocidal state. And that was one of the things that um, persuaded China to again uh, speak to the Sudanese government and, and, and induce consent to international action. The most contentious of all of these, I guess, was Kosovo in 1999. Uh, NATO action, as I said but earlier, but no UN Security Council mandate for that. And China was particularly concerned about that because it was the fragmentation of Yugoslavia. And fragmentation is obviously not a good thing as far as China is concerned. There's the Tibet issue, the Xinjiang issue, and of course also the Taiwan issue, which is part of one China uh, as far as the PRC is concerned. 
So the current position, if we were to kind of pull this together and say, where is China currently in, in international society? Current position on intervention is cooperative and collaborative, um, is the preference, and it seeks really a triple consent mechanism of local, regional and global consent or endorsement. So it is important that Indonesia in the East Timor crisis said, yes, that's all right for the international community to become involved. It's important that there's a local um, a support for that. It's also important that there's regional support, ASEAN in that case, or the African Union in the case of Libya earlier this year. The African Union supported um, military engagement uh, by the international community, and that was critical in changing China's position on that, otherwise it would have vetoed the motion. And, and global, there must be Security Council endorsement. So a triple consent mechanism is, is the basic Chinese position. And otherwise, broad-based scepticism uh, about global action across, across so sovereign state frontiers for a number of reasons. Uh, Iraq would be you know, an, a prime exhibit for the, for the first point that often, even though the language is about helping the, the, the citizens of the target state, the actual intent is to promote the interests of the intervening state. Secondly, the UN Charter does not provide for this kind of engagement very much. So most, most such, such action is in violation of, of that. Thirdly, the concern, and this reflects the fact that China's been on the receiving end of colonialism in the past, much as it may in the future be itself an imperial um, state, but you know, a, a concern, a worry that what was used in the 19th century to justify all sorts of actual colonialism could be used in the 20th century, 21st century to justify all sorts of neo-colonialism. And human rights is just another excuse for the West to impose on everybody else. And on, on a very practical or prudential, pragmatic ground, um, the, the belief, the documented belief, again Iraq, say, or some other cases, that ultimately, despite so many good intentions, more harm, in fact, results. Finally, my final one of the three chapters is looking at Confucianism. And I want to take those three concepts that I said are, are central to the debate, sovereignty, rights, and justice, and just see you know, how they, they might be interpreted from a Confucian perspective. Now, at first blush, it seems difficult to run um, or to develop a notion of sovereignty within the framework of Confucianism. I start with a Confucian perspective, and it seems to be difficult to develop a notion of sovereignty, precisely because of the central concept of Qian Sha, you know, the notion of all under heaven, the mandate of heaven invested in the Chinese emperor, and the notion that China is, or at least should be, the Middle Kingdom, or at the heart of a peaceful and unified world order, in which the Chinese emperor uh, exercises a benevolent rule on behalf of the people. So there's no sovereign, there's no, ish, no borders there, and no issue of state sovereignty as we would recognize it today, because this was seen as a single um, Chinese world or Chinese dominated world. But at the same time, a, another key concept in Chinese Confucianism is, is the concept of graded love. That it's right and proper and correct that I should. Um, experience or feel more love for my family than I do for my clan and more love for my clan than I do for my nation and so on through a series of concentric circles radiating outwards from the family. That is how Confucianism works and graded love is a key, key issue at the heart of the Confucian worldview. Um, and that makes it relatively easy to develop the notion of, of, a, of a, a structured world or, in, in contemporary language, a bordered world, you know, a world in which there are frontiers. You know, there were not only the Chinese people, but also the, the, the people in the tributary, tributary states who were part of the civilized world for Confucianism because they, they knew Chinese culture, they accepted Chinese culture, they um, recognized the, the superiority of Chinese culture and, and also of the Chinese emperor. Um, so they were part of the civilized world, but there were also graded ranks of barbarians beyond that. So a ver very much um, uh, a hierarchical world order, which made it relatively easy. Benjamin Schwartz argues that Chinese um, intellectuals and the Chinese state accepted the notion of China as a nation state, 
rather than as an, an imperial order in, in the 1890s. He puts it in, in that decade. You know, he, he, he says that in, by, the late, by the end of the 19th century, China was, was perfectly comfortable with being a nation state in, a, in an international system. And structured engagement with global issues, there has been some of that too. Sure, you know, my, my love for, my concern for, my responsibility for those people living many thousands of miles away is far, 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 far less than it is for my family or for, for people in my clan or for people in my nation. But it, doesn't, it never tapers down to zero. There's always something left. There's always some concern left, even for the most distant people. And that, that allows for some form of structured engagement. And if you read Mencius, for instance, you know, he's, he's, Daniel Bell and others have argued that there's, there's a kind of just war argument in Mencius, that sometimes there's a right of rebellion that is latent within the Chinese people, but that can be exercised and the mandate of heaven can be withdrawn from the existing emperor and invested in somebody else if that emperor is not uh, pursuing that mandate in a satisfactory manner. Equally, there's also a latent right of intervention uh, in, implicit in, in Chi Chinese imperial rule that, and, and it was seen, Spence talks about this in the 18th cent century in the case of Vietnam where the Chinese did become in, engaged with um, politics in Vietnam even though Vietnam was, was a tributary state not part of China nevertheless there was an intervention so I don't think sovereignty is, is, is that big of a deal you know, if, you, if you're trying to to see how China might engage with global issues. It's, it's not impossible to embrace um, a, a Confucian Chinese worldview, though there are different readings of, of what sovereignty requires of us and how we should engage with other states. Rights, I think, is very different, though. I don't think there's um, such a central notion of rights in the Chinese tradition as there is in, in the Western tradition. If you think of of all of the discourse that came out of the notion of the rights of man in the 18th century and has extended to this day, is that rights are in some sense constitutive of who we are in the West. You know, strip us of our rights and we're no longer fully a person. We're no longer entirely a human being. Um, but that's not the case in the Confucian tradition. Take away people's rights and as long as the, the, the emperor is, 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 is looking after their welfare in a benevolent fashion and Confucian ritual and all of that is in place, then they can still be fully human. And I think that's a, a key difference that, you know, there's limited protection for individual interests. And you can see the difference if you look at what you do when rulership goes wrong. You know, of course, everybody in the world would like to be governed by, you know, a, a good ruler, a good king, a good emperor, or whatever. But the question that motivates much political debate and political theory is what to do if things go wrong. In the West, the answer is, give us human rights, and that can be the protection. That's our protection against authoritarianism, against tyranny. Um, in the Chinese case, that's much less so. Uh, what to do in case of problems? You first appeal to Confucian values and you know, try to indicate to, to the emperor or, or whoever is, is failing to, to pursue the, the, the mandate of heaven correctly that they have lost their way and appeal to that notion of Confucian benevolence and, and, and try to get them to, to self-correct. Secondly, if that doesn't work, then promote mediation through elders within the society and only finally uh, resort to litigation. So I think human rights in the Chinese worldview are very similar, have a similar function to litigation more generally. That is, they're a fallback apparatus that can be triggered when everything else goes wrong but as I said, are not constitutive of who we are and are not so central to the story. In the Western tradition, human rights, or rights generally, come at the beginning of the story. In the Chinese tradition, they come at the very end of the story and are a last resort to be called upon um, when all else, all else fails. That said, there is, of course, the development of a Chinese rule of law now. Um, contract is nothing like as secure in China as it is in many other parts of the world. But nevertheless, the Chinese legal system is developing we saw recently there was the case of the two-year-old run over by you know, a van and the argument was that some people didn't go because um, you know, it's not a Confucian thing to care for others outside of your immediate family circle, so no need to be the Good Samaritan for strangers. Other people said, well, Chinese didn't rush to her aid because, precisely because they were, feared being sued for anything that might have gone wrong you know, uh, in, in terms of her, her recovery or death. 
And that suggests that legal issues are becoming more present within Chinese debate. And maybe, ultimately, there will be you know, a Chinese discourse on rights that can become part of global justice debate. Finally, looking at global justice, China is much closer to the communitarian Western tradition than it is to cosmopolitanism. And that, the next slide says a bit more about that, so I won't go into it. But, um, and, and it's also very materialistic and, and utilitarian with a focus on the greatest good for the greatest number in terms of just let's go for growth. You know, let's, let's, let's make that the core of our development activity. Um, but I just want to look a little bit at some contemporary Confucians and how they're reading China's proper engagement with international society. Of course, respect state, state sovereignty and, and local rule or rulers. That's fundamental to the Chinese, contemporary Chinese worldview. But also there are arguments about a hierarchical world order, a reinvention of this, this ancient notion of every, all under heaven being kind of unified and united. Um, and, and Professor Yan is quite interesting. He argues that you know, this fiction that uh, you have sovereign state equality within international society should be exploded. It doesn't make sense to talk of Ethiopia and the United States of America in the same breath. Of course they're not equal. Um, we should recognize that. There are great powers out there. They should be accorded uh, greater formal status within a hierarchical world order. But at the same time, they should therefore assume more responsibility. And that's an argument for a, a structured form of Chinese engagement with global issues and, 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 and a Chinese engagement with, with issues of global justice. Okay, so getting close to the end now. Um, what impact might rising China have on global justice? That's where I started. I've, I've, this has been very schematic and it's been an overview of very complex debates, not only in the West but also in China. And I can only you know, give a very reductionist account of everything that's going on. And so I want to flag that up at the beginning. Of course I haven't covered everything that, that needs to be covered to give a full answer to the question. And there's the Zhou Enlai caution asked about the French Revolution. It's too early to say. Well, certainly if he'd been asked about rising China and global justice, it's certainly too early to say about that. We're at the very start of a debate that is going to continue to roll on throughout the rest of our lives, I'm sure. But I think some things are clear. There are some pointers to how, as to how rising China is likely to impact on debates about global justice. One is that Beijing doesn't buy the prioritization of rights, as I've, as I've argued, that you find in, in much Western discourse. And that means that whilst it's, it's, it's in conflict with um, much that's said in the West, it's actually in harmony, to use a Confucian term, with, with the positions taken by many other um, poor, underdeveloped nations. You know, China's position on state sovereignty, on global action, is very much endorsed by a number of states in, in third world contexts. And it looks like there's a difference not only in terms of means but also in terms of ends. It's not as if China feels there's a different path that could be taken to an agreed goal of global justice. It's that global justice itself looks different from a Chinese perspective. That, that seems to be the case. Um, and, and so, as I said, it seems to be a, a, a case of cosmopolitanism versus communitarianism. Western, the, the Western drive behind the, the pursuit of global justice is very much based in individual human rights. And the argument is that justice can, can, or, can be or is global and, and on, on some occasions must transcend frontiers. That is, the one state sovereignty is an important organizing principle of international society. Sometimes it must give way. And it must give way when human rights abuse or violation is severe, like um, genocide, ethnic cleansing. I mean, people put the line, put the boundary in different places. Different theorists have different, different ways of judging when sovereignty should give way. But the basic argument from a cosmopolitan standpoint is there are some instances when sovereignty is no longer the number one uh, principle of international society, rather justice is, and therefore sovereignty cedes place. Usually that's not an argument for world government. You know, most cosmopolitan theorists are careful not, not to argue for that, because it looks so extreme, but rather to argue for better forms of global governance, and, and they propose a whole range of reforms. Against that, the Chinese position is basically statist. Um, that, that's actually one difference between Chinese communitarianism and Western communitarianism. If you look at Western 
communitarians, on the whole they do not talk in terms of the state. They talk in terms of a nation, David Miller, of a people, Michael Walzer, uh, sorry, uh, John Rawls, or of a community, Michael Walzer. And so that leaves open the, the Tibet question, for instance, you know, should there be global action in favour of Tibet? Well, there's no such issue as far as China's concerned, because it's states that are the key actors in international society. Forget about peoples, communities, nations, no. They are not the, the units of international society, it's states. And the Tibet question, therefore, never arises in, in, in Chinese discourse. The argument, though, that comes out of Western communitarianism just as much as out of Chinese is that justice is not global. Justice is, is local. And it's interpreted and understood locally. And it is bounded by established frontiers. Again, actually existing state frontiers as far as China is concerned. This is partly an argument about communal integrity. The, those people over there have the right to determine their own governance arrangements. We may not like them, but it's their right to come up with an authoritarian polity if that's how they choose. And it's partly an argument about cross-cultural knowledge or understanding. We can never know enough about what makes that society tick or function to actually develop some governance arrangements that will work for them. Only they can do that themselves. Um, so that's actually a much deeper argument. That we don't have the data, if you like, and we certainly don't have the, the understanding or the interpretation to make governance work for anybody other than ourselves. So that's... In many ways, the, the, ten, or the two poles of debate that we find when we, when we add rising China to contemporary Western debates about global justice, I think there might be, there clearly is some overlap in utilitarianism, which is driven by materialist concerns. You know, both Western and Chinese policymakers argue that they, they want to confront, quite rightly, want to confront global poverty. So there's some overlapping consensus there. Um, though often the implementation uh, or the policy conclusions that are drawn from that overarching concern are very different. So in the West, you know, the, the emphasis is on governance reforms as an essential part of an anti-poverty, global poverty strategy. Whereas in China, the, that is not the emphasis. The emphasis is strictly on business. And the contention is that Chinese engagement is far less paternalistic and charitable than is Western engagement. So finally, these are the final three slides. Um, it strikes me that the two extremes both look unsustainable. Both uh, many Western cosmopolitan proposals and also current Chinese positions. Neither of those looks to be um, a way forward in that just looking down the list of those cosmopolitan proposals, these, these, these are some of the leading thinkers. Um, you know, China's got no interest in restricting global benefits to Democrats for as long as it itself is authoritarian. It has no interest in a democratic second assembly at the United Nations, no interest in a UN volunteer force charged with policing rights violations across the world, no interest in porous state frontiers, unless the Security Council says it's okay for them to be porous in this instance, and certainly no in interest in world government. So all of those things look to be non-starters once China is acknowledged to be a major player in global justice debates. But at the same time, you know, I'm not comfortable with China's position on, on, on global action, and I think it's, it's right and proper that it should be challenged as well. So in a sense, the two, the two polar positions look unsupportable or unsustainable. Um, is it only in a kind of materialistic concern with just growing our way out of global poverty? Is that the only, where, only, only place that we can find a, a possible overlapping consensus in this domain? Um, should we just say, well, OK, we'll look for the best practical means to growth, to economic development, but we'll agree to differ on everything else, on, on other possibilities for global justice and on the end point for global justice? Is that the best that we can do? Or can we find some sort of accommodation between Western cosmopolitanism, Chinese communitarian, communitarianism on the, on the other side? It strikes me that there are um, really a couple of core arguments, one on each side, which could form the basis for um, a more synthetic or, or fused position globally. Um, from the West, the insistence that um, cross-border knowledge is possible. You know, as I said, part of the communitarian argument is 
we can never understand other societies well enough to be able to uh, prognosticate or develop reform proposals for them. Well, a key part of the Western arg argument has to be that we can actually understand other societies quite well. And we can understand that they're very diverse. And that what the government says is not the, the sum total of what the people think. And we have mechanisms for understanding that, that wider range of views. There are listening projects taking place in development contexts now to try to understand what local people want. Not what they need, not what we think they need, but what they expressly say that they want. Um, there is a whole raft of, of global data, you know, ever more present. And there's all sorts of um, social media which give us a very complex understanding of other societies. That is not to say that we can decide for them, but I think the idea that cross-border knowledge is, is, no long, is not possible is something that can, can be shown to be false and that can be a part of a Western contribution to an agreed platform. Equally, though, I think the Chinese insistence on um, a major commitment to the communitarian political claim that those people over there have a right to determine their own governance arrangements. I think that has to be part of a consolidated position as well. The whilst we may not like every um, form of governance arrangements that is witnessed in the contemporary world, we do have to respect, to a large degree, local people and local rule. So, final slide, you know, is a synthetic understanding of global justice possible? Frankly, I don't yet know. I mean, I, it's still an open question, still an open, open debate. But, you know, from the West, the contribution is, um, would be, say, a package of universal basic human rights and, and cross-border interests. It's, it's, it's right and proper that, say, this, this American missionary interest in putting the world right, there's something good in that, no matter what the Chinese say, no matter what they say about not interfering in other people's business. You know, that, that commitment to global justice is something we shouldn't lose sight of, and we should be interested in uh, global problems. But the Chinese position, I guess, if you boil it down to four words, no state, no justice, is also important. You know, China ultimately believes that the key forum for justice, for delivering justice, is the state. And whilst that can be problematic in a very, very small number of extreme cases, generally it's the case that the state is the, is the right forum for a pursuit of justice globally, not just, not just locally, but it must be a locally constructed state. So what does that mean? That we should, I guess, as I say, look to wants, not needs. We should attend more, we should observe more, and we should respect more local opinion. Um, and China would claim to do that because it doesn't, it doesn't try to impose governance on other people. Um, we should engage in experimentation and learning across borders and we should practice equality as much as possible. But at the same time, we should never give up on the pursuit of global justice as a, as a proper activity within international society. State sovereignty and all of that is not enough um, in the conditions of the contemporary world. There should be a partnering issue and, and vibrant concern for um, problems of global justice as, as we witness them in crises or in chronic conditions. So I'm going to leave it there. Thank you very much and I look forward to the discussion section. Thanks. I can do it myself. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Maybe you could just say who you are. I don't know and maybe others don't. Mm. So when you, you know, you, you look at the, all the 
and the list of the people talking, you know, books yes. from the <laughs> beginning to the end. It's, you, you raise the issues that you know, people are changing their attitudes. And then also you look at the China, actually, you raise questions, you don't know, you know, we don't know what China's going to react. But this, this is the globalization. And China is also the part of it, the actor. So at, a, uh, at this moment, China also is changing. China is taking place in yeah. China as well. Yeah. Uh, maybe in, the, in terms of politics, uh, I'm not the issue China have, uh, you know, hold firmly that some steps. But in terms of the, you know, the business, if I look, actually there's lots of things China is trying to copy the West. Mm. And uh, so the, the, the question I want to, to ask is uh, how if the, the issue possibly is similar in terms of the politics, because you come from the discipline of the politics, I come from the, um, the discipline of the um, business, international business. But the issue is that how do we approach it? Mm -hmm. At the moment, if they're lacking the approach, how do we understand this thing? But at that moment, uh, the Western view from Western view, upbringing the Western view, because we can't really uh, you know, ask the Western to measure the, the differences or even to understand what to, you know, how people view the same things, interpretation, perception is different. Mm -hmm. But that is also the historical and properties uh, associated. And also the interaction between the units, for example, China and the U U.S. It's a confrontation or friendship, you know, it's all uh, involved. So the question is, what do you suggest, in, for example, for academic research? What, how we bring in this approach and enable us to understand these issues in much, in much in a coherent way and have a I mean, there is, there obviously there is an academic literature, um, and I said that standing behind all of the more um, sensationalist, if you like, accounts of what China amounts to these days and how we're to capture it, there is a very careful academic literature. There's, there's. Um, a lot of stuff on China's socialization in international society, and you know, Johnston at Harvard, and other other social states, his book, and and he's written a lot of stuff actually, um, arguing that gradually China is becoming a, a kind of mainstream global actor. It is becoming socialized in, in in established ways of doing things within contemporary international society. And I mean, I've used that term all the way through. Um, you know, it's a contentious, to international society itself is a little bit of a contentious term because not everybody would accept that and there are different interpretations of how international society functions but yes, there, there is a lot of research just looking at, at China as a, as a WTO operative or China as a, a security council actor or whatever um, that is slowly uh, accumulating a sense that China is, is conforming to um, established ways of doing things. But I actually think we look, need to look a little bit deeper than that. And I think, you know, what we saw of, say, Chinese activity when it was negotiating to join the WTO or as an early WTO player doesn't necessarily tell us much about how China's going to be in the sphere of global justice, of those, of those big political questions raised by the whole issue of global justice. So whilst I think it's a fabulous literature and, you know, it, it needs to be explored as part of this debate. I don't think it gives us all of the answers because I don't think what China does on technical questions of, 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 of business law or trade law or whatever doesn't necessarily tell us very much about how China views ultimately very political questions about um, cross-border action. But it does exist and it is, it is already quite impressive. Does that answer the question or...? Not entirely. <laughs> uh, for example, you, you raised about the, uh, you know, China, China's attitude and position in terms of the inter uh, intervention. Mm. And obviously, you know, Chinese, then maybe that's not political issues, you know, at the surface. And the issues about the deep culture, 
for example, Chinese always say, you know, Chinese is the and Qingguan, uh, do you speak Chinese? Not enough no, to understand no. everything you're about to say, no. <laughs> so it is means even the, uh, the best judge, uh, it is difficult to, understand, to, to uh, give a fair judgment about the internal matters, mm -hmm. the issues, because mm -hmm. the, there's a history. Mm -hmm. There's yeah. maybe the fighting the, in mm. the past that is the, you know, so on the father's side and then the, the second one is the mother's side. So you never know. So the attitudes, that, that kind of uh, the issues, actually it's the culture, culturally embedded. So there's issues about the ontological you know, mm. interests and mm. the cognitive the routines may be different. So how we see these issues if we just you know, stay um, at the political, for example, you know, from the political domain, possibly you can't really uh, you know, mm. in the good understanding. Yes. Okay. Thanks very much. Please. And my name is Julian Lieber. I'm a layman rather than an academic and an accountant. I find it quite interesting when you look at the involvement of China in Africa that much of the negative comment comes from countries other than the countries in which China is invest investing in or aiding or whatever. So you don't find that a recipient country like Angola is upset about the Chinese investing in them. Maybe one or two individuals are, but the state level they're not. But what I find interesting is that in Burma, where there's a very significant amount of uh, involvement from China, we've seen recently um, the cessation of a major project mm. and the suggestion that the Burmese state may not be any longer comfortable about the involvement of China in Burmese affairs. And I'm wondering if this might be something of a turning point or something that could build or something of significance or do you think this is just a little sort of bump along the way? And for Burma or for China in international society? I mean, specifically within Bur Burma or more, more broadly well, in the I'm global? I'm wondering whether what's happening in Burma is something that we should look at and think about and whether mm. that is something that might happen in, in other countries mm. as well. Okay, I mean, I think the Burmese case is a very special case as far as China is concerned because not only are there a lot of Sino-Burmese inside the country, but there's also a lot of Chinese Chinese inside Burma. And, and you know, the, the estimate is there's about two million Chinese who work and sometimes live in, uh, inside the country, and they've gone there since 1988. There was a there was a Burmese open door in 1988, and you know. Mostly Western actors did not go in, but a lot of Asian action actors did, and above all, they were Chinese. And so there's an extremely large physical Chinese presence inside Burma, far greater than you would find in, in many sub-Saharan African countries, where sometimes also the, the Chinese physical presence and, and culture is seen by local people as problematic. But in Burma, it's got to a, a stage where much of the parts of Burma that border China, Kachin State, Shan State, Mandalay as a northern Chi uh, Burmese city, are effectively Chinese cities now. The restaurants there, the small businesses are Chinese. And so there's a groundswell of local um, belief that this is a form of, of neo-colonialism on the part of China, and, and a belief that um, the country is, is is in danger of being gobbled up by China, which doesn't exist in other parts of the world. So in that sense, I think... Burma's a special case. Um, you know, why did the government, after not, not visibly listening to the people for the last 25 years or even 50 years, why did it say now we're suspending this project because it, uh, it's the will of the people that we do so? Why was that the case? I think the reason is because they, they could see they had enough intelligence about their own society to know that this, this, this concern about the dam was actually the focal point of a much broader... Uh, campaign or, or even not campaign, just you know, in, in, implicit worry within, within the society about Chinese, Chinese activity. And if it wasn't nipped in the bud now, by some, something changing, then there could be um, major uh, social unrest and disorder. There were anti-Chinese riots in Burma in 67. Uh, most, most other ethnic groups had been kicked out in the early 1960s. Indian businessmen and traders were largely kicked out of, of Burma. Pakistanis were kicked, largely kicked out in the early 60s. But Chinese stayed. And they've become a focal point for a lot of unrest you know, in the society. So I think 
the government's reading of the situation was was a reading you may not find in many other contexts because the Chinese presence simply won't loom so large and there won't be the sense in, say, Angola that unless we send a signal that we're aware of the China threat, you know, our people are going to lose faith in us as the repository of national values, the protector of national interest. And so I think that was a large part of what drove the, the Burmese government concern. I think it probably is a, a blip in the road of, of Burma-Chinese bilateral relations, because as far as China is concerned with Burma, um, the most important thing is that it remains a stable state. You know, the last thing China wants is to see Burma go up in smoke in, in any sense, because Burma borders the western part of China, which is the most diverse ethnically and the most unstable politically. So it doesn't want any instability on its western frontier, particularly after problems recently in Tibet and Xinjiang. Secondly, I think China is, is interested in Burma as part of its security strategy. And only thirdly, the resource concerns, business issues come into the frame. So I think China can live with this. I think China wouldn't, wouldn't have chosen to suspend a $3.6 billion project. But I think it can understand where the Burmese government is coming from. And I think as long as this doesn't become a pattern whereby you know, it's just one of a whole series of, of dam projects, there are pipeline projects, all sorts of things going on. As long as there's not a pattern that's being established here, then Chinese, China can live with that as a blip. And I, I think in, the, in, the, in terms of the bigger picture, as I said, I, I don't think we'll see this... We, we won't see governments taking anti-China decisions for the same reason, because other, other countries do not have two million Chinese working and living inside them in the way that Burma does. Yeah. But it is an interesting decision, because, you know, if, 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 there's, if there's one pointer that the... Burmese political system may be changing. It's not so much the talks with Aung San Suu Kyi, it's not the fact that a few prisoner, political prisoners have been released. It is the fact that for the first time the government was prepared publicly to say we're prepared to act for, the, for our people rather than for China and that hasn't been witnessed before. So you know, maybe, maybe there's a little bit of real reform going on inside Burma. Yeah. Hi, um, I thought you potential relations to and um, your, your lectures really come after my lecture on global justice. Um, my question is that you talk about a Confucian um, belief in China and um, how that sort of contrasts with the Western uh, terms of liberal, liberal ideals which obviously lay the foundation for human rights. Um, do you think that if, even in the future, when China might not or might come to terms with um, the universal of human rights that we also want China to, to adopt, um, would they become hegemon that will have sort of power, sort of, um, not just economic power, but sort of political um, projection to other countries around the region and the world? Like, I'm talking about the super of the hegemon. To I have no idea, to be honest. I really don't know. All, 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 I, all I really feel is that China is a sufficiently important international player that we should now start taking it seriously for this sort of debate and, and, and parallel debates. So whether China is going to become the new hegemon and, and will rule the world in Martin Jake's terms, honestly, I don't know. Um, whether there'll be a kind of quasi-tribute system in Southeast Asia and other parts of East Asia whereby um, those states have to look to China for political pointers and leadership. I don't know uh, whether we're likely to have you know, a series of regional Tianxia systems. Again, I don't, I don't know. So I don't really want to crystal ball gaze um, about that issue. But I do, I do want to say you know, China, need, China matters now. So it may not be hegemonic, but it is uh, significant. That's, that's, that's the extent of how far I want to go. What do you think? Mm. Which is high from that one. Yeah. Um, I, I actually think that's a less interesting question than how, how China can contribute to the sorts of debates that are out there in the international arena. For, sh for sure it's here to stay, that's my feeling. I, I'm not with, you know, coming collapse um, thesis. No, I've just um, been not doing a lot of research on human rights and universal human rights. And mm. To hear you talk about the conventions sort of ideas of human rights and human rights mm. not non-human rights at all. Yeah. Liberal, liberal ideas that we come from, or the West come from that. Sure. Um, 
Yeah. So really underlying that the individualism and how you know you, the, the text of how um, with culture and me, um, how that sort of interact. Um, there's a there's a tension between individual mm. uh, freedom and social order, and mm. it, so China has established that within you know their society and in social order, yeah. and how the West can really see how consumption is done. Let me get that word right. <laughs> um, work even in society because as you can see, you know um, unrest everywhere in mm. UK um, mm. and Europe, obviously. Hmm. Okay, I mean, if you want to read up more on that, my, my Hong Kong U colleague, Joseph Chan, has written some really interesting stuff on, on Confucianism and human rights. Um, you know, he, he argues that there are two broad camps of interpretation. One is that you simply cannot run a human rights store if you start from a Confucianist perspective, that they're, they're just kind of incompatible. And another, one, and another camp says, yes, you can get human rights out of Confucianism, uh, but they look very different. It's a shorter list, it's more economic than political. All of that stuff. If you if you need some follow up stuff, then just write, send me an email. I'd be happy to send you a couple of references to his work. And Daniel Bell's written a lot on that as well, Thank from you. Tsinghua. I'm doing yeah. that. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Um, Graham Thompson, I run a small charity called Black the Trust. We support some development projects in China. Mm. Uh, also worked out there for five years doing business in Taiwan. But my question is picking up your comment about UN votes and. and to the UN and non UN activity, and particularly mentioned Kosovo mm. and the concern about succession. Yeah. Secession. Yeah. Presumably that was about violent secession from state on state from a larger previous state, which makes me wonder what was the Chinese attitude to the separation of Czech Slovaks about Czechoslovakia mm. in the 1990s, and what might be China's attitude to the potential separation of Scotland? <laughs> I don't know if China's got a position on Scottish independence. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Actually, it's a good point about the, the Velvet divorce, uh, Czech Republic and Slovakia, and I don't know the answer. But um, I think actually China would not be keen on, on any form of secession. I mean, its, it's position on, on established state frontiers is, is so um, dogmatic that, I, yes, yes, I guess. They would have to acknowledge that if two groups within one current state say we want to now be two states, they kind of have to acknowledge the authenticity of that desire. But I, I doubt that they'd find themselves saying anything supportive. I'm not sure if they sent congratulatory telegrams to the Czech and Slovak peoples in the early 1990s. But I'm going to look that up because it's a it's interesting. It's yeah, a, and I'll, I'll, interesting yeah, yeah. I'll certainly see if they can develop a, a position on, on Scottish independence. Yeah. Yeah. I Should we take a couple just together and then is, is time nearly up? Nearly yeah. Yes. So two quick questions which I'll answer together. Um, yeah, I'm asked to follow members of school student here and I'm, I was wondering, what I think I've gained from your talk is that on a lot of, a lot of aspects of international relations, China just view things from a, a fundamentally different perspective from that of the West. And I was wondering how different, I'm not sure how much you know about this, but how much, how different you think India's perspective is to China. Mm -hmm. And the other question? Well, there's a small thing when you mentioned that China has brought the most people out of poverty recently. Mm. I was wondering what you meant by poverty and also if it was from subsistence, rural farming into a, like, a market economy into this urban areas. Right. I mean, the global definition of absolute poverty is less than a dollar a day, and if you use that measure using purchasing power parities, then um, the Chinese achievement, I think there's about 500 million people been lifted out of absolute poverty in the post-Cold War era. And as I said, it's almost uniquely a China-India achievement with China having the largest role. So it doesn't say anything about whether they left the land whether they became part of the market economy. All it says is that they have more than a dollar a day on purchasing power parities. That's, that's the very simple measure that's used. So, you know, it's, 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 it's a little bit crude and, and you know, a dollar ten a day is not that much better than 90 cents a day. But, you know, just, just as a broad sense of the China, Chinese development story, it is a striking um, statistic or, or image. Um, India and um, international society. 
Um, in, India is a bit of a complex case. I mean, again, the, the Burma case that I know most about is something of a window on, on, on India and international society. You know, 1988, when there was the, the democratic uprising and Aung San Suu Kyi became a global celebrity and got the Nobel Peace Prize in 91, you know, India was extremely supportive of democracy in Burma. The Indian Defence Minister housed um, a number of Burmese Democrats in his house when they were chased from Burma. You know, open support. Some of it, um, a lot of it driven by India's position as the world's largest democracy, a beacon of democracy in, in Asia. Um, and, and, and India's positioning in the global system precisely on that, on that uh, issue. And some of it was driven by personal factors. Aung San Suu Kyi grew up with Rajiv Gandhi, who was Indian Prime Minister at the time, and so that personal connection was also important. That changed completely in about 1993, when India un unveiled a, a Look East policy and ever since then, for, for 18 years since 93, India has been a mirror image of Chinese policy. I mean, it's really, it's, it's fought for the same business contracts, it's, it's sought the same oil and gas concessions, it's also sold military uh, material to the Burmese junta. And, you know, so in, in India, whilst it's increasingly close to the United States, it's increasingly um, close to Western views on many abstract issues, on many practical issues, it's aware of the competition with China in Asia and it's responding in a reactive fashion. So there's actually not much leadership, I don't think, from India on Asian policy questions. It is finding itself um, pushed into a corner increasingly by China and, and having its position defined by whatever China does and trying to balance China as much as possible. There's the, there's the Chinese string of pearls um, strategy, which is, is seen by India as an attempt at encirclement. China is very close to Pakistan, if China is also close to Burma, and has military installations in the Indian Ocean provided by Burma. Well, then on one side Pakistan, on the other side Burma, you know, this, and, and a long border with China, then this becomes very much of a concern to India. So, you know, India is not in the place that any of us would want it to be on Burma, but that's mainly for strategic questions rather than issues these issues of global justice I've been talking about. Okay, um, we have to stop here, but uh, discussions can continue next door over <laughs> yeah. um, drinks. And when do I get to relax? <laughs> <and isn't> that... <laughs> Sorry. Um, and thank you to um, Ian. Thanks very much. Thank you.